Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second SPINE webinar organized by EPOS. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk to you tonight about spondylolisthesis, what every orthopedic surgeon and pediatric surgeon should know. Uh, we have to thank uh, Orthopediatrics, who is supporting this uh, great webinar. We have a very nice faculty tonight to talk to you. So we'll have uh, Ilka Elinius from uh, Finland, from Helsinki. Uh, we'll have Sebastian Pesanti from Marseille, France. We'll have Carol Asler from Basel, Switzerland. Tom Schossler from Utrecht, Netherlands. And the chance to have also Professor Minero from Lisbon, Portugal. So welcome everyone, enjoy this webinar. This webinar will be recorded. So some of you who are not attending will have the chance to watch it again, except the talk from Ilka Elinius, which will not be recorded. So let's start now with uh, a short introduction about spondylolisthesis. So as you all know, spondylolisthesis is a very heterogeneous condition. So every patient is very different. The management of spondylolisthesis remains very controversial regarding when to treat the patients, what age, at what stage, and how to treat them. And these controversies exist for both low grade, which will be developed by Carol Hassler, but also high grade, which will be developed by Dr. Schlosser. And we all know as a spine and orthopedic surgeon that the management of high grade spondylolisthesis can be very challenging with high rates of complication, both neurological, but also mechanical. So in the literature, if you look at all the published paper, you'll see that a lot of techniques and surgical techniques and different braces have been described. There are numerous implants, approaches, which can be anterior, posterior, or circumferentials, but also there are controversies regarding fusion labels. And if you look at the papers published, there are very few reports with very long-term functional outcomes, but also long-term radiological outcomes involving a global analysis, not only focal. So the goals of this webinar will be to better understand the pathology, to learn the key radiological parameters that you need to know when you're seeing a patient developing spondylolisthesis, and also describe the main treatment options depending on both patient's balance and spondylolisthesis grade, and we'll develop in the last talk the specific advantages and complications of all the techniques. So I will now give the talk to Professor Elenius to start the first talk about definition and etiology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brice, for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to, at this stage, thank you very much. OK, thank you, Dr. Elenius, for this. Uh... Great talk. So we will now see uh, what are the necessary investigations and what are the radiological parameters that matter in uh, spondylolisthesis and spondylolysis. So just uh, uh, for memory, uh, some definitions that uh, have already been uh, uh, described by Dr. Alenius, but it's uh, I think quite important that you keep that in mind that spondylolysis is a, a pars inter interarticularis interruption. So it corresponds to a fatigue fracture and is associated or not with a spondylolisthesis. The spondylolisthesis, on the other hand, corresponds to the anterior slip of a vertebral body along with the pedicles and the transverse processes secondary to ischemic ruptures, rupture or elongation. So what are the rad radiological parameters and necessary investigations? So in isolated spondylolisthesis, usually the standard radiographs are uh, sufficient, but please keep in mind that uh, in 80% of the cases, spondylolysis are free of symptoms, meaning that if a patient comes to you with a back pain and you discover uh, uh, spond a spondylolysis is not, it's not necessary, necessarily the, the cause of the symptoms. So all the investigations that you will perform will uh, uh, have the objective to uh, uh, prove you that the spondylolysis is the cause of the symptoms or not. Uh, 
So on the plane radiographs, this one should be standing AP and lateral. They can obviously be normal. And uh, in, uh, in this situation, you will have to uh, uh, undertake other investigations. But it can also show the pars interarticularis interruption, as you can see here on the right hand side. And sometimes oblique radiographs can be performed and could be useful even if they are, if they are not uh, systematically recommended. And uh, at this point on oblique radiographs, you will see a little dog that is drawn here by uh, the different parts of the posterior arch. When you do not have spondylolysis, the dog has no collar, as seen here on the right side, but on the left side, if the dog has a collar, it means that there is a lysis, so it can be useful. But if you do not want to do uh, oblique radiographs, you can ask for a CT scan, which is the better exam with the best sensibility for lysis visualization. It's uh, particularly useful uh, in uh, unilateral lysis that are uh, usually not seen on plane radiographs. And you can see here uh, the lysis on the left side. And here, compensation of the uh, contralateral isthmus that probably uh, corresponds to a pre-lysis status. And last but not least, the MRI will be the uh, key exam uh, to uh, uh, check for the accountability of the symptoms, because if you uh, do not see any edema uh, on the, um, at the site of the lysis, it means that it's not the cause of the, sim of, of the symptoms. So it's uh, um, mandatory in case of lysis if you want to uh, check the accountability of the symptoms. Here a little case example of a boy, uh, of a 12-year-old boy with a back pain. On the radiographs, you cannot see uh, any clear sign of uh, lysis. You can just see on the AP view a sacralization of L5. Then an MRI was undertaken where uh, you can see edema of the L4 posterior arch on both sides, but uh, mainly on the left side, but still no clear sign of lysis. And then a CT scan that uh, shows a clear lysis, a bilateral lysis. So this is a, a classical cascade of, uh, of exam that you should perform in a case of isolated spondylolysis. In cases of spondylolisthesis, you will have to uh, ask for uh, some investigations at diagnosis. Obviously, plain radiographs are the main uh, exam because it, it will allow you uh, to uh, assess a lot of aspects of the spondylolisthesis and particularly, it will allow you to do the diagnosis this radiograph should be standing, AP and lateral, and full, full spine must be visible on uh, the radiographs. You will be able to evaluate the amount of sleep by using the Meyerding classification, as uh, uh, described before. So the Meyerding classification uh, divides the sacral and plate into four equal quarters, and according to the amount to the the, the, the to the amount of sleep of the uh, of the vertebra, you will be able to uh, uh, put your patient uh, in different grades. So the grade one is from zero to 25, the grade two from 25 to 50% and so on. You can, uh, you can drop down this, this classification into two groups. The first group would be the low grade spondylolisthesis that uh, regroups the grade one and grade two uh, with less of 50 percent of sleep and the high grade uh, would be uh, would regroup the grade three and four with more than 50 percent of sleep it's of major importance to do the um to to stratify your patient according to uh, this classification because it will guide you uh, to the management options that you will uh, that you will propose to your patient. The percentage of sleep can also be calculated according to uh, L5 or L4 um, uh, vertebral body width. You will be able to assess the local deformity by, by measuring the lumbosacral kyphosis. In normative patients, this angle should be a lordosis about 25%. And uh, in a case of unstable spondylolisthesis, you will have uh, 
this lordosis becoming a kyphosis and uh, being very predictive of uh, uh, worsening uh, ability of the of the spondylolisthesis. So it's uh, very important to calculate it in order to uh, be able to predict the, the worsening. Pelvic parameters are of major importance because uh, they will show you if compensation mechanisms already occurred in your patient. This will uh, guide you to uh, know if this is a stable form or an instable form of spondylolisthesis. As described before, if you have an anterior slip of the vertebral body, you will uh, um, you will you will uh, put your pelvis backward, so you will increase the pelvic version, the pelvic uh, the pelvic tilt in order to put your spine back over the sacrum. And if the slip worsen, uh, you will ultimately flex your knee in order to increase the pelvic retroversion. So this is very important, as if uh, compensation mechanisms have already occurred, it means that uh, it's uh, unstable and that you, you should do something something to, uh, to stabilize the spine and to uh, uh, get, uh, get back a proper alignment of the spine. Global alignment should be also uh, evaluated on uh, the radiograph, so this is why it's important to have full spine radiographs. On the lateral view, you can have either flattening of the spinal curvature, spinal curvatures that corresponds to uh, um, uh, painful mechanisms. But most of the time, and especially in uh, cases of unbalanced spine with the unstable uh, spondylolisthesis, you will have a hyperlordosis that will uh, occur that is here to compensate for lumbosacral kyphosis and an overlying TK flattening. On the AP view, you will be able to see a listesic scoliosis, which corresponds to an asymmetric slip and which provokes a vertebral rotation and a secondary scoliosis. At this point, is there, are there other investigations uh, necessary? I think that it's not mandatory. It's the same than in, than in the spondylolysis. The CT scan is not mandatory because obviously if you have a spondylolisthesis, it means that you have uh, either a dysplastic spine or uh, ischemic rupture. But the MRI is once again of major importance as uh, it will allow you to uh, check for accountability of the symptoms. Preoperatively, you can ask for functional radiographs and especially uh, hyperextension films in order to check for the uh, reductibility of the deformity. It was uh, um, frequently done um, in the past, but uh, uh, it's not mandatory because usually it uh, does not have any impact on the surgical strategy. So it can give you some information, but it will not change uh, the way you will manage your patient. The MRI is mandatory in case of no deficit or for the preoperative assessment. It can uh, give you some information about uh, the intervertebral disc status, but more importantly, it can uh, show you uh, the cause of the neurological deficit. In case of uh, dysplastic uh, spondylolisthesis, you will have a narrowed uh, lumbar canal. But in case of ischemic rupture, which is uh, uh, more frequent, you will have a reduction of the L5 uh, foramen and a nerve root uh, pinch, a nerve root that will be pinched between the pedicle and the L5 S1 disc. This uh, recent study have shown that uh, uh, with MRI, it was possible to find uh, some changes in the intervertebral disc and is uh, uh, very promising because uh, by pushing further this, uh, this kind of uh, research, we will maybe be able to, uh, uh, to assess or to assess the prognosis of the spondylolisthesis, especially in, ter in terms of uh, uh, worsening. So in summary, in case of spondylolysis, standing X-rays can show you the lysis, and if this is the case, you will have to ask for an MRI in order to uh, be sure that the symptoms are related to the lysis or not. But if no lysis is seen, you can ask for a CT scan in order to uh, uh, visualize the lysis. And if so, ask for an MRI to check for the, the accountability of the symptoms. <laughs>
In case of spondylolisthesis, standing X-ray usually are sufficient in order to uh, uh, make the positive diagnosis. You will be able to uh, calculate to assess the amount of sleep, to assess the local deformity by calculating the lumbosacral kyphosis, and to check for compensation mechanisms that uh, uh, may occur at this point. The MRI is uh, uh, also interesting for the accountability of the symptoms and in case of neurosymptoms in order, in order to understand why neurological deficit occurs. For the follow-up, there is no consensus yet, but standing radiographs are recommended every six or 12 months. And the CT scan may also be interesting, if, even if not sy systematic, in order to, uh, I mean, if, you, uh, if you're looking for a fracture healing, this is the exam that you should, uh, that you should ask. So thank you for your attention. I will uh, now give the talk to uh, Carol Lassler uh, for the management of low-grade spondylolisthesis. So thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Breeze, for inviting me over. As you heard, the, the working horse of diagnostics is a conventional radiograph. And I want to point out that at least one time you should uh, have a long cassette. Mainly in the many athletes, uh, we see usually gymnasts who overload the whole spine. You often see a multi-level involvement of the spine, as in this example. And if you do only MRIs, as it often happens, you will miss the instability. You see on the MRI, there is no instability, L5 is one. And as soon as the patient is upright, the L5 is slipping forward. It's also important, even if you think it's a, a purely isthmic type, that you look also at the posterior elements, mainly if it comes to surgery, to really make sure that your surgical approach and your instrumentation and your fusion technique is appropriate. If you look at low-grade slips, uh, so slip less than 50%, most of the patients or most of the individuals are asymptomatic. And they complain about lumbar pain when they're standing, if they're involved in any sports activities, and usually they present the first time in the second decade of life. It's important to stress out that there is no correlation between the percentage of slip and the amount of pain. And usually in the low-grade slips, there is only translation and no segmental kyphosis. You can easily find out if the, the lysis is the problem by hyperextending the lumbar spine and by that provoking the pain. The majority of the patients with a symptomatic slip usually improves with non-operative treatment, which includes modification or restriction of sports activity, adequate physiotherapy. The effect of brace is uh, questionable. The natural history is benign, and as the Finnish studies showed, it usually happens during the growth spurt. So this is one of the main risk factors. And the other risk factor is the percentage of the pre-existing slip, and to some degree also the dysplasia. And very important if you counsel athletes, sports activity is not a risk factor for progression. So if you have a gymnast, with uh, grade one to two, you don't have to take the gymnast out of the sport only because of the radiographic finding. And thanks for, to Dietrich Lenska for, for the slide, which is important in the long term, that the outcome of low-grade spondylolisthesis in the long run is very good concerning pain, work status, and also concerning disability. So it favorably, favorably compares to the, to the healthy population without sleep. Indications for surgery in inferior slips are most of the time lumbar back pain. And the indication uh, comes up when there is a persistent pain after a course of conservative therapy of more than six months. Usually it's related to a bony edema, to the spinal instability, and also to the disc degeneration. Rather infrequently, radical symptoms are already present and the third indication for surgery is a progressive slip. Surgical options uh, are manifold. You can directly repair the lysis, you can fuse in situ with or without instrumenting. 
You can fuse posterior laterally, anteroposterior, or only anterior. You can fuse inside to, or you can aim at reducing the slip. And you can combine all those sorts of operation with the decompression of the foramen or of the canal or both. So let me go through the options and I, I want to, to share with you some uh, history and uh, thank my, my two mentors, Erwin Marscher and Fritz Hefti at this stage. Erwin Marscher invented and introduced the hook screw uh, 40 years ago. Meanwhile, we have abandoned it because it's often difficult to find uh, enough purchase in the superior facet. Sometimes not only in our hands, but also in the literature, there is a high percentage of implant loosening, of implant failure and of implant prominence. And also, as far as I know, the company does not produce the implant anymore. Uh, at the bottom, I show you one revision case where we swapped to, uh, to a technique with particular screw and uh, uh, a hook construct. Direct repair is indicated for motion preser preservation in, uh, in rather young individuals with still healthy discs. So the, the disc needs to be hydrated, otherwise it doesn't make sense to aim for a, for a direct repair. The limitations of the techniques I just pointed out is a small pedicle, spina bifida, or if you have to uh, decompress the segment. It's technically important that you remove all the fibrous cartilage in the lysis, that you also cut the tip of the lower facet if it's uh, like a pincer type, if, it, if there is direct contact, that you correct both ends of the bone before placement of the implants, and that you put enough morselized bone graft there. Alternatives are the Bach direct repair with uh, one screw crossing the lysis zone, Scott wiring, or a urot. If you compare all the techniques, it seems that the pedicle screw laminar hook construct uh, has the lowest uh, complication rate and the highest fusion rate. There is not much information about uh, patient-related outcomes. In cases where the disc is completely black, as in this 13-year-old gymnast with like a grade two to grade three slip, you have to fuse. And there are many options to do so. We favor, if the, the anatomy is normal, we fav favor a postolateral fusion and an instrumentation L5-S1. You don't have necessarily uh, to uh, reduce the fragment. So in this case, we, we uh, fused inside too and the outcome was uh, perfect. I'll show you a rather exceptional case of a six-year-old. We desperately aimed to uh, improve the symptoms by very intensive conservative therapy. We even uh, proposed a brace, which she refused. It was a rather difficult hyperactive child uh, with uh, a dysplastic anatomy at the back. So it was not possible to perform a direct repair. And we regarded the segment as uh, absolutely unstable. So we fused her L5 to S1 with a postolateral fusion and a favorable outcome. How to perform a solid, uh, solid posterior lateral fusion uh, needs to be pointed out. It's never mentioned in the literature, and I just want to stress the, the, the most important points. You have to make sure that the size of the L5 transverse process where you put your bone on is big enough. It has to be more than two centimeters or square centimeters. You have to prepare the fusion bed before, before screws placement to gain access. So we, we uh, aim at osteomizing the sacral ala and flip the graft as I show on the CT scan on the right hand side. So we leave it, we leave a little anterior hinge and we flip the graft 90 degrees anteriorly. So it's placed directly between the sacral ala and the, the L5 transverse process. Then you put your graft there, you stably fix it, and you could, can put some morselized uh, bone graft in addition. Of course, there is a lower fusion rate if there is a, a dysplasia around, and if you have to decompress, then you have to think about also stabilizing and fusing the anterior column. Reduction and circumferential fusion for uh, low-grade slips have, has uh, been claimed by some of the authors, so they routinely perform posterior instrumentation, postolateral fusion, and also 
anterior support with uh, with cages. I don't think that this is necessary in, in all the cases. In most of the cases with low-grade slips, you have a normal posterior anatomy and enough bony surface to to uh, constrain your fusion to a postolateral fusion. Of course, you need a longer operating time. There is some more mobility, higher fusion rates, question marks. In those series, there was also a pseudotrosis rate of 10 to 15 per, uh, percent. So we go anteriorly if there is a transitional slip. Uh, so uh, transition to grade three with some kyphosis if there is severe posterior dysplasia or in performing in high performing athletes uh, who require even more stability. Olisthesis and scoliosis, uh, Sebastian showed uh, an example. In most of the cases, there is no direct correlation between the slip and the scoliosis, as in this case, but it might be that there is one, and you recognize it by the fact you recognize it by the fact that also the, the lower lumbar spine, so L5, L4, L3, already rotates away in this part of, of the scoliosis. So in most of the cases, you don't have to address the spondylolisthesis to to gain some influence on the scoliosis. In this case, the patient had persistent symptoms, so we went on to uh, postural fusion and instrumentation. So let me summarize in a somewhat euphemistic way if we look at low-grade spondylolisthesis. Mo most of those individuals remain asymptomatic for their whole life long. About 90% of the remaining 10% with symptoms respond to non-operative therapy. So you're looking at only 1% of the initial cohort with low-grade spondylolisthesis, which suffer from ongoing pain despite non-operative therapy and where you step on to operative therapy. And of this 1%, 80 to 90% respond very well to surgery. So you look at 1 to 1,000 with a spondylolisthesis who probably goes on with chronic pain despite all efforts to, to stop the pain. And I think you can call that a very benign course and condition. So the short take home message is to conclude, the natural history of low-grade allesthesis is benign in terms of pain and slip progression. Age and percent slippage are the main predictive factors for further progression. And sports, very important, is not a risk factor for it. 80 to 90% respond to non-operative treatment and refractory pain is the number one reason for operative therapy in the low-grade slips. And usually this pain very well responds to, operative, uh, to an operative strategy as listed here. And usually there is an 80 to 90% chance that the patient is happy after surgery. Now we go on and the next talk will be Tom Flosser who uh, upgrades the complexity and talks about options for high-grade spondylolisthesis. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Professor Hasler. Uh, I would like to share with you the uh, options for high-grade spinal diseases um, in children and in adolescents. Uh, my name is Tom Sosa. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Um, as we have just learned, uh, high-grade spinal diseases is a deformity in which L5 has slipped forward more than 50% on S1. Um, it is important that it is a progressive disease and this kyphotic in grown children. Uh, however, it is very rare in a population of about 6 million people in Scotland, uh, one patient a year needs surgery for this condition. This plastic means that the L5 arch is poorly formed, um, the uh, posterior elements or the pars is elongated or there can be a lysis of the elongated pars and the upper sacrum is this plastic. If we uh, look back at all patients with high-grade slip in Scotland over the last 25 years, all had an uh, elongated pars. However, 86% of the elongated pars were fractured. Um, all had a sacral doming. Uh, all had a trapezium shape of L5. Uh, and uh, a majority had a spina bifida occulta at L5, or mostly at S1. And also they had a more than average pelvic incidence. Clinically, 
those patients present with the compensatory mechanisms for the local kyphosis at the L5-S1 junction. So they compensate by a relative low doses in the thoracolumbar area. Um, if they are decompensated, they have a positive sagittal balance. And also in the lower limbs, they compensate by uh, hip flexion and knee flexion. Uh, this can create hamstring spasm and uh, even toe walking can be a sign of a, a high-grade spinal disease. This can be summarized as the Fallon Dixon sign. And this is a similar pattern as we know from the degenerative adult spine. Clinically, uh, almost all of these patients will have back or thigh pain. Only a few will have radicular problems. Um, in the population we studied, we did not see any patient with a, a Carter syndrome. Uh, many have uh, tight hamstrings uh, or a positive sagittal balance, but only the radicular symptoms are uh, quite rare in this population. And uh, uh, almost half present with a scoliosis. The treatment options for high-grade spinal diseases is mostly surgery, as we uh, just heard. Uh, conservative treatment can only be considered in a select group of patients that have a good baseline quality of life, that have a normal posture, that have a normal neurologic examination and imaging that remains unchanged over time. So most of them will be treated surgically. The goal of surgery for high-grade spinal disease is to relieve the pain, to resolve the neurologic dysfunction, to avoid progression of the slip, to restore the postural balance, and the, to improve the self-image with, I think, the minimal number of segments fused. Um, however, high-grade uh, spinal disease surgery is extremely demanding and potentially dangerous. In the next talk, we will hear about the complications, but multiple others report about uh, a catastrophic neurological injury, nerve root deficits, and non-union uh, occurs frequently. There can be progressive slippage, and sometimes revision surgery is needed. The four debates that are still ongoing on the surgical options for uh, uh, this uh, deformity is, I think, the approach that needs to be used, uh, the need for reduction, the need for uh, decompression, and the different techniques for stabilization. So for the approach, it can be anterior, posterior, Wiltser 360, but a reduction is needed. It can be no reduction inside the fusion, a partial reduction or a complete reduction, a decompression can be a direct decompression, indirect decompression, or no decompression at all. And uh, there are various techniques for stabilization. Uh, it can be an uninstrumented fusion, so only local bone grafting. Um, it can be a uh, stabilization by standard pedicle screws in L5 and S1. It can be a pedicle screw transfixation uh, from F1 into the L5 body. It can be uh, interbody cases from the front or the back can be used. And there are also some reports about transdiscal struts or fibular allografts in the midline. And many use combinations of these techniques. I will discuss them one by one, these discussions. So for the approach for high grade slip, uh, it is shown that circumferential uh, is superior to posterior only or anterior only for union. However, 360 degrees metal is not enough. After complete facetectomy, you need a good bone bed posterior. For the reduction, the reduction means not only uh, translation, but also angular correction of the kyphosis. Uh, reduction has biomechanical advantages because it lowers the risks of non-union and can avoid further progression. Reduction can uh, provide indirect decompression of the foramina. Um, and the angular correction of the lumbosacral kyphosis um, will improve the spinopelvic balance and will improve the clinical appearance. However, complete reduction is often not necessary because reduction more than 50% can increase the incidence of new neurology. Um, also, some state that interbody grafts can act as a fulcrum in the reduction, but that did this does not necessarily yield better long-term results. Do we need to restore the lordosis in a high-grade slip? This is the classification by the uh, spinal deformity study group. For the high-grade slips, 
uh, it differentiates between is there a compensation by the pelvis or is there no compensation by the pelvis. And if the pelvis is compensating by a pelvic retroversion, the patient can be globally balanced or can be globally unbalanced. And for the, the pelvic balance, uh, now they recommend to, to use the L5 incidence below 60 degrees as a cutoff between uh, because of the sacral domain, it's more difficult to measure the pelvic incidence, so they now recommend to use the L5 incidence um, to determine the pelvic balance. There are only a few reports that uh, on the long-term outcomes in terms of restoration of sagittal balance and the quality of life after high-grade spondylolisthesis surgery. There are reports for mixed populations. Um, in those uh, populations where mixed techniques were used, um, they showed an improved self-image with restoration of lordosis. Uh, in the Scandinavian reports on un instrumented inside diffusion, they uh, showed excellent outcomes in terms of function and pain. Uh, domain scores in the quality of life questionnaires, but uh, slightly lower self-image scores than the controls. Um, and in our series, we performed a partial reduction posterior transfixation, where we showed it's a, also in the long term a safe technique with uh, good outcomes in terms of function pain as well as self image. Um, this is a report that uh, I would like to share with you. We uh, collected all patients over the last 25 years that were treated for a high grade slip in Scotland. They were all treated in one. A national spinal deformity surface, and they were all treated with one surgical technique by uh, three different surgeons. And this was a posterior only partial reduction bilateral pedicle screw transfixation technique, where no direct decompression was performed in any of the cases. On average, they were 13 years of age at surgery, and they were followed for uh, on average nine years. Um, this is the technique uh, that was used. So the patient is position prone on the uh, operating table with the hips in extension and the knees flexed and already by the positioning on average 20 degrees uh, uh, of the lumbosacral kyphosis can be corrected. Then L5 pedicle screws were introduced and Steinman pins in S1 and uh, before they were drilled into the uh, L5 body, angular correction uh, was performed um, at the lumbar sacral uh, junction um, to correct the local kyphosis and the Steinman pins were, were drilled forward into the L5 body. And here in this step in the procedure, care should be taken that not to over distract the L5 S1 disc. Um, there was only an indirect decompression and then the most important uh, posterolateral fusion with the iliac bone graft was performed. Uh, similar to the technique as described by uh, Professor Hassler. Uh, all SRS scores improved from pre-op to final follow-up. Um, the patients that had radicular symptoms pre-op, they recovered completely. However, there were a few complications. Two had a wound infection of the, a total of 28 patients. Three had a transient L5 radiculopathy. One patient had a sacral fracture. This was a patient that was not fused to the pelvis. Um, However, there were no reversions for non-union in this population. On average, the slip percentage improved from a grade three to a grade two. The uh, local lumbosacral angle improved by 30 degrees from 70 degrees to 100 degrees. And pre-op about uh, one third had a balanced pelvis while post-op about two thirds had a balanced pelvis. And uh, the global balance was restored in all patients. I think most important, uh, the, uh, we observed higher SRS scores in the patients that had a balanced pelvis uh, at final follow-up compared to the patients that had an unbalanced pelvis. So these were the ongoing discussions in high-grade spondylolisthesis, the approach, the need for reduction, the need for decompression, and uh, there can be various techniques used for the stabilization. Um, for the approach, it can be anterior, posterior, or Wiltshire approach, or 360. Um, for the reduction, there are higher union rates reported if the orthostasis is reduced, and by the angular correction, pelvic and global balance can be restored, and quality of life can be improved. If you apply angular correction, you should aim for an L5 incidence below 60 degrees, 
decompression, often there is no need for a direct decompression, uh, in my opinion, even in high grade slips, uh, and you can in that way minimize the iatrogenic risk. Um, and about the techniques for stabilization, uh, at least we need to create an optimal environment for a union, so optimal mechanobiology and an optimal bone bed. Um, and uh, in my hands, with the transfixation technique, uh, we will get a, a good environment for this union. So that is the discussion on the options for hybrid spinal diseases. And now we go to the uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Minero, on postoperative complications and outcomes. Hello. Hello, everybody. Well, many thanks. I'd like to thank Professor Lariborg for inviting me for this talk. And um, I will start off, we had a very interesting <clears throat> earlier on introduction about the different classifications of spondylolisthesis. But what we must realize is that they are not all the same. And we have separated them in two big groups, which ones there are, the low grade and the high grade. And why is that? I think the best example we can give is looking at the myodine classification, where the low grade goes up to 50% and the high grade goes beyond from 60 to 100%. But what's the difference between the two? Well, the reason why we need to take this into account in these two groups is because the rate of the complications are different. Well, if you look at the literature, there's plenty of evidence that this type of procedure for the low grade are at low risk of major complications. And the reason why, obviously we've just heard, is because the natural history of progression of low grades is rather benign, and the great majority of these conditions are treated conservatively. Well, on the other hand, progression of the sleep and the malalignment of the sagittal balance, that occurs usually in the high grades, and many of them do not do well with conservative treatment. But on the other hand, looking at the literature, you need to realize that these type of procedures are at a high risk of complications, high risk of neurological deficits, in particular if you do the maneuvers for reduction of the high grades, and that you must take into account. Well, if you look at the literature, this is a very interesting paper that came out a few years ago from the SRS and the database, and if you look at 25 thousand procedures for the pediatric spines, 606 were done for spondylolisthesis. The great majority are about 90% were isthmic, obviously. But if you look at the complications rate, it is very interesting, about 10% of complication rates. But the more relevant is the neurological complications. And if you see the, between the two groups of the ones that had reductions and the ones that did not have reductions, the larger the, the group are at the ones where you proceed, uh, where you had the, 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 the reduction. And it's interesting because about 60% of these neurological complications, they did happen post-op, but uh, about 23% happened after 24 hours. And unfortunately, we need to take that into account. If you look at some of the papers that were published prior to this, uh, this paper, it's interesting because again, if you look at the ones that had reductions and the one that they had only fusions, the higher of complications rate meant the neurological complications were higher in the ones that had a, a reduction, obviously. So you, we need to take into account that the overall rate of uh, it's almost the combo of neurological deficits is almost a double for the ones that were the high grades, because obviously for the ones that you need to do some type of procedure in order to improve. So comparing the two groups, the high grade were the ones that required decompression, the ones that in the required reduction, and obviously for the ones where we had the highest rate of neurological post-op deficit, and you need to take that into account. So the conclusion from this paper was obviously for the pediatric ischemic and dysplastic spondylolisthesis, there's a relatively high rate of morbidity. If you have to perform any reduction, I mean, there's a high chance that they will develop complications of neurological deficit, and obviously if they have the high grades where you need to reduce for some sort of reason, you need to take into account that you may produce some neurological deficit. This is another interesting paper that was published quite a few years ago from St. Louis. And if you look at this group of patients with a high-grade spondylolisthesis, 
the group one were the ones that only had posterior posterior lateral fusion group two had posterior posterior lateral fusion but instrumented and the group three were the ones that had circumferential fusion and if you look at the pseudarthrosis rate you see the first one was almost 50 percent of them failed and the other one about 30 percent and the other ones they all fused and they've linked that sort of end result with it with a measurement of the surface of the transverse processes and it's interesting to see the ones that went to a solid fusion they had about a similar 3.5 square centimeters and the one that did not fuse had less than two square centimeters so they look at that and uh, they the, 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 they establish the connection that usually the high grade they have they have very dysplastic transverse processes so you cannot rely on the posterior fusion alone and obviously when you look at the complication for the ones that were instrumented you see that usually the ones that were under either undersized the uh, s2 or the eyelid screws and the ones that had properly sized not only the uh, s by court s1 by cortical or the eyelid screws that were seven millimeters large and about 16 millimeters in long obviously they were the ones that ended up well so in the, and besides they reinforced the idea how relevant it was to combine these details with an anterior column fusion with bone graft so when you look at the more common um, complications we've got three main groups which are the neurological the implant related and obviously the wound related well let us look at each of them when you look at the neurological deficit it has been increasing if you look at the srs from 1996 you can see that it was 1.3 then it has been increasing to um, this report five percent it is more likely in the high grade spondylolisthesis again about 11 percent this is more likely obviously if you do the reduction maneuvers it's almost a double and it's more likely if pre-op there is already some kind of nerve compromise if you have to decompress the spine then you increase the chances of uh, complications if you look at the pseudarthrosis again these are as we all know difficult to diagnose accurately and very often we have to rely on indirect signs like the lucency around the screws or screw breakage it is more likely if the transverse processes are dysplastic as shown in last in the paper that i've just mentioned obviously in the one that were non-instrumented mainly in the high grades but obviously if you don't um, if they are less likely in the uh, circumferential fusion mainly in the high grades as we can see on this paper as well what about the complications implant related they are less likely in the low grades as we've seen they're more likely in the ones that have unicortical s1 screws more likely in the ones that you have to do reduction maneuvers and obviously if you misunderstood the sagittal balance by the classification which is very good of the spinal deformed study group and instead of doing an interbody fusion you've just relied on the postural lateral fusion in the ones that were high grade and therefore with dysplastic transverse process those would fail this was a patient that was referred to me years ago where that happened unicortical s1 screws and pull out and obviously it went back exactly to the same situation that was before so skin breakage and infections one of the other issues that we have to take into account and mainly when there are this lumbar sacral kyphosis where you've got all these pelvis i mean retroverted and very prominent sacrals, you need to take that to account and you did remember either if you use iliac screws or even the s1 screws they become so prominent, mainly in the grade four on the spondylopsidosis, that you need to take that into account. Obviously, the width of the subcutaneous fetus can help you, but beware of the bulky implants as well. And this is the girl that operated a few months ago, and you can see how prominent this fuse. This is a very a syndromic girl from Africa. Well, how can you avoid these complications? I mean, the neurological ones, the first thing you need to use EMG monitoring, mainly if you're going to perform any reduction maneuvers. You have to expose the L5 nerve root. And remember that we need not have EMG monitoring. We had to look and rely on the bowstring sign on the tension of L5 nerve root. And that was the only thing that we could see. However, having the EMG monitoring is not 100% reliable because 
complications and deficit can happen afterwards. So you need to be careful to take care on the manipulation of the nerve roots as well, and be aware of those cases that had a previous neurological deficit due to compression of some of the nerve roots. Well, this is the case that I've shown you where you've got this spondylolysis with a sleep angle of 50%. And we know if it is more than 30, the likelihood of progression is tremendous. And uh, where we ended up operating on this girl. But the funny thing was that the bone was so hard, like osteopetrosis, that we had to use the drill. And we've reduced it to about 100% with the direct vision on L5 nerve roots and we EMG monitoring, there was no problems. 48 hours later, she developed bilateral, almost foot drop, and we went back and take part of the reduction away in order to improve that. And we ended up with a sleep angle of 30, which is not too bad. What, how to avoid the neurological and the, the deficit? Well, beware of the dumbbell bell L5 risk. When you slide the L5, S, the L5 disc, over the dome, the dome of the S1, if you haven't removed the whole disc, the likelihood is that you're creating an herniation of the content of the disc into the canal. So if it was already tight, then the chances of provoking a neurological deficit will increase. But if the neuro deficit is minor and reduction is small, probably it's just enough to wait and see and what happening. Usually I, I put my patients all for the first 24 hours with the knees bent with a pillow under their knees in order to decrease the tension on the L5 nerve roots afterwards. If the neuro depth is relevant and with a large reduction, like it happened in this girl that I've just shown you, I went back and reduced and lose a bit of the reduction, which is important. But early post-op neuro depth you should investigate either with a CT myelogram, because sometimes MRI is not a good image, or an MRI, but the main thing is to differentiate because traction or a nerve compression that could be sorted out. What about the pseudarthrosis? Well, you need to take care in turn, look into the pelvic, spinopelvic parameters for the reasons that we've just heard. And if it's low and symptomatic, you do a postural lateral for the low grades or a circumferential instrumented fusion for the high grades, if they are balanced. We used bone autologous bone graft. And remember, if they require reduction, you need to protect the best one by cortical, either West 2 ailer iliac or with S1 L5 transdiscal fixation. Implant related, obviously optimize the patient's condition and the local scheme. Remember the types of fusion that we've just heard from, from, from Professor Schlosser. Remember the reduction maneuvers. And remember if you have to, to fuse to the, to the pelvis, the type of fixation that you need to do. And obviously, you need to choose the good bone graft and the source where you're going to take it. Here you've got the poor boy that had a very high of his PT with a failed fusion from the back where we did an interbody fusion. And again, you've got a very good sort of postural lateral fusion and graft. This is a type six that was very unbalanced. You've got this girl with a very high sacral slope. So it is a, a type five where we've done a fusion with trans trans um, uh, discal done trans discal uh, fixation. But you remember that you have to remove the whole disc. And before I put this this uh, screw in, I fill in the gap with bone graft. So make sure that you've got that plenty of bone graft for the fusion. And this is the other one, obviously type four with that um, that is important to fuse in a different way. Well. What about the long-term um, outcomes? And this is a paper that was already mentioned earlier from, from uh, Helsinki, where it is interesting, a long follow-up from 67 patients with a high grade, 70 years follow-up. And it's interesting to see that we, they were not able to correlate between the residual lumbar sacral kyphosis and any other clinical radiological outcome parameter. And this was very interesting because there's one one of the most important issues that we try to reduce. And the, the conclusion was that circumferential fusion was the best for the clinical outcome. And the degenerative changes were more common on the disc above, obviously. And the longer the fusion, the higher the chances of developing develop the degenerative changes on the disc above. So stay short.
This is another interesting paper that came from Toronto for the sick children, where they compared the operative with non-operative for the high-grade um, uh, spondylolis thesis. And if you look at the different uh, at the different scores from the items of the two group of patients, they are so similar. The ones that were operated on and the ones that were treated conservatively. And if you look at the group of the treated conservatively that failed, that were only 10, the striking feature in the, all the assessment was the slip angle. So it was, as I mentioned, below 20, there's a good prognosis. It is above 30, usually that's a bad prognosis and that will progress. So if they are minimally symptomatic, probably the high, even the high grades, it's safe to watch and see. But obviously the ones that are symptomatic, they need to be treated surgically. And the instinct, another instinct fact is that delayed surgical intervention did not result in worse outcomes and measurement of the sleep angle is probably more important than the sleep grade. So these are two important uh, conclusions. The other paper that was interesting that published in 2017 was the national trends and complications in short-term outcome that came from St. Louis. They look at retrospective um, cross-section analysis of kids in patients database, and they have looked at 2,600 posterior fusions that were done. The great majority were posterior spinal fusion and only small olive and antero, uh, anterior and posterior combined. And if you look at the, these three type of procedures, they realized that the one that had higher complication rates, not only neurological, but overall complications rate, long, long um, uh, stay in hospital was longer in this group as well. And obviously the cost, as you can see, was much more expensive. So the conclusion was that if you look at the overall and if you look at the different procedures that were done, obviously, and the studies recommended all posterior approaches for the treatment of spondylolis thesis and in children and adolescents, probably. And to finalize this, um, this uh, paper that came out current evidence regarding the treatment of pediatric lumbar spondylolis thesis from the evidence-based medicine committee where they've looked at 6,000 papers and selected 50. And the conclusion was that reasonably evidence to support surgical treatment in the setting of progressive or clinical symptoms. The, the current best available evidence suggests that patients with a higher sleep angle are more likely to fail in particular the high grades. And as far as the surgical technique is concerned, evidence suggests that reduction and circumferential fusion for high grade with requisite instrumentation lowers the pseudarthrosis um, rate. So in summary, the classified the spondylolisthesis according to the spinal pelvic alignment, I think is so relevant because it gives you guidelines about on what to do in each of the different cases. Define your strategy and plan your procedure. Remember that unbalanced high grade, they need reduction. If you do reduction, then you need EMG monitoring. If the reduction maneuvers are done, then you should aim for a circumferential fusion. So if balance high grades, you need at least to aim. It is an in-situ fusion, but at least you need bone contact, more than 50% of interbody contact. And if you need to go to the pelvis, you've got the alternatives either to protect the S1 screws, which need always to be bicortical, and then you've got the Ehler iliac screws or the transdiscal one. So the take-home message, I would say, define your treatment strategy for the high grades, and if reduction maneuvers are required, use MG monitoring. But remember that almost a quarter of complications can happen after and later, and even with normal EMG monitoring during the procedures. High grade spondylists, they need at least 50% of interbody contact for fusion. The relevance of the sleep angle below 20 or above 30 is so relevant for the prognosis that can give the ones that will need surgery. And remember, only the symptomatic, progressive, pediatric spondylolisthesis, no matter if they are low grade or, are, or high grade, they are the ones that need surgical treatment. Thank you.
So I will pass you on to our chairman, Professor uh, Laribord, in order to summarize. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all speakers. I'm trying to log on the last uh, talk, for, which for some reason, if Sandy can uh, send me back again the presentation. So I want to thank uh, all the speakers for their great talks. I, I think they, they made um, very good points and all the most important points were discussed. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for this small delay. So I want to thank uh, all the speakers for their great talks. I think most of the key points were discussed in this webinar for both actually uh, very experienced spine surgeons and also the non-experienced spine surgeons. And I think there's there are a lot of key messages uh, to get from there. I think first, and this is very important to emphasize, is I think a spondylolysis or a pars defect does not mean back pain. So this is a very important point that we might have a little bit of time to discuss on is how often should you follow the patient with pars defect if they're symptomatic or not symptomatic. I think as Carol really well emphasized, the natural history of low grade spondylo is very often benign. So these patients should not be monitored radiologically every three months. Very important as well that sports is not a risk factor for progression. I think that is a key point because most of the patients we see, and at least I see in my practice, come with a, a, a stop of sports activities in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And that's usually very often what a general practitioners tell their patient when they do the diagnosis and they see this, the clinical reports or radiological reports. And I think that in my experience, most of the high grade spondylo often requires surgery. And as it was emphasized in two different talks, I fully agree that circumferential fusion is mostly indicated for biomechanical reasons but we have to agree and say that there are high complication rates both neurological and mechanical and this was very well described by professor minero and i think this is something we all need to know to inform well our patients so the radiological analysis should be both segmental with all the pelvic parameters the slip angle measurements but also global because once again, knowing if your patient is balanced or unbalanced is really a key point. And that was very well described by Sebastian Pesanti. And I think the MRI has a really great importance for both reasons in low-grade spondylo to make sure or to have better arguments to see if the back pain is related to the pars defect or to the spondylolysis, because very often this patient can also have a lumbosacral abnormality, anatomical. And once again, the investigation of the L5-S1 disc is of great importance when you want to define your surgical strategy. So this is an examination that should be often uh, carried on in these patients. So thank you all for participating in this webinar. I think we have a couple minutes for discussion, so I will ask all the faculty to come back on screen. And uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but at least three questions were raised by the faculty, by the attendants. So the first one will be for Sebastian Pesanti describing the radiological uh, analysis. And if the faculty, other faculty have different opinion, don't hesitate to raise your hands. First question was, should we always ask for a full spine lateral radiographs when a patient, a pediatric patient consults for back pain? What do you think, Sebastian? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for uh, this question. It, it's uh, very interesting. I think that uh, uh, in every case, if you have a, uh, if you have to take a, a, an X-ray for a patient, it should be a, a full spine radiograph uh, with either lateral and AP view. Uh, 
because on this uh, on, on this radiography we'll be able to see the local condition if it exists and but also the the, the global alignment of the spine dot. So I would say that there is quite no more indication for uh, uh, localized uh, X-ray. So I would say yes, uh, you will have to 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 ask for a full spine radiograph. And if the symptoms are, are um, more than three weeks, you can uh, either ask uh, for MRI uh, uh, quite quickly. Thank, thank you, Sebastian. That's a, a good answer. And, and the second question, which is actually related to Tom's uh, talk, but also to Professor Minero is, so, but Professor Minero mentioned it widely, but is, do you always use neuromonitoring when you plan to reduce even partially your your spondylolisthesis, what and what kind of neuromonitoring? That's important. So Professor Minero really mentioned the need for EMG, and uh, what is your uh, experience and practice, Tom? Can you tell us? Um, yes, for uh, high-grade spondylolisthesis, we use more extensive neuromonitoring than we do for uh, 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 terrestrial AAS cases. So we, in addition to the normal neuromonitoring of these sensory and motor, we also use the EMG of L5, but also of the uh, sphincter, of the anal sphincter. Yeah. Does everybody, does everybody in the faculty have access to EMG intraoperatively uh, for these kind of patients? Okay, so this is the the experience I have as well, and what, that's an uh, I would say a continuation to the question is. How often, or I mean, do so, your patients who have uh, deficits, because we all have sometimes L5 deficit partial uh, postoperatively, did this patient have normal EMG intraoperatively? Because in my experience, at least, I think the postoperative management is maybe more important than your intraoperative surgery. Because in most of the cases I had deficits, the EMG remained normal, as Professor Minero mentioned, and usually the deficit happened when the patients started extending the legs, the hips, and went back to the standing position. So just a quick question for all of you. What is your, I mean, at what delay do you put the patient in standing position after a high-grade reduction? So Sebastian. We, we can hear you, Sebastian. Uh, we can hear you, Sebastian, or maybe... Yeah, oh. I, I said uh, as quick as possible, we, we try to uh, put them uh, in a standing position uh, like after a couple of days, uh, if they are not too much painful. So so first week? Yeah. Okay, and you, Tom? First day. First same, day? Same yeah. Il Ilka? So, however, um, the hamstring spasm can take months to resolve. So even directly post-op, they, they can have a, a, a decompensation. And Ilka? Yeah, I, I always check the narrow status post-op to see the dorsiflexion and the hallux extension of the kratos. If it works well, uh, I mobilize them immediately. So we make them sit on the same evening and then stand and take four steps next morning. Thank you. And Carol? Yeah, maybe we have also to uh, to point out that those cases, even in a pediatric center, they are quite rare. Uh, yeah. Also, you, Ilka, in your article last year in Spain, it was one of your conclusions. We have a couple of cases a year. So even as a specialized pediatric spine surgeon, it's quite a rare event to to operate on those heavy cases. So every every case is different. But I also agree, we, we mobilize the patient as soon as possible. So on a practical level, usually they don't feel like getting mobilized within the first two or three days because it's painful, they have morphine and so on. So practically they are sitting on the first day, they are probably standing on the sec second day and then starting to do some steps. But you, we, we check them neurologically by an independent neurologist because we have some pink glasses on. So to have real, we assess them preoperatively and we assess them immediately postoperatively by the same like independent surgeon, who, uh, a person who is not a, a member of the surgical team. Okay, good point. And you, Professor Minero? 
Well, I usually tend to get them up and about, usually not uh, exactly the next day, probably the day after. But one of the things, it depends on a little bit. If there is a lot of uh, sort of radicular pain, usually I tend to delay that. And usually, depending on the tension that I've got on the L5 intro up, usually that's the reason why very often I leave them with the knees and the pillow under the knees and I stretch them regular, sort of gradually in order to refrain. But for instance, this little girl from Africa that I've just shown you, I, t I always test them um, immediately after surgery and I do exactly the same as Ilke was mentioning. However, this girl was up and about at 48 hours and subsequently she developed the neurological deficit that fully recovered. But uh, for me, it was a surprise because I've never seen any sort of deficit so late, but um, it does happen. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's a big debate. So I, I, we also position our patient with a triangle pillow uh, yeah. under the knee, as you do, to flex the knees a little bit on the hips. But I think maybe we're getting a little bit more biased by uh, AIS surgery because after AIS now, we put the patient standing on the next day. But a few weeks ago, I was discussing with Professor Dubousset, and he was telling me that when I was preparing the talk, he was saying that, you know, in a, when I was operating my spondylolisthesis high grade, they were keeping, they were staying in bed between four and six weeks minimum. And, and it's true that maybe we're increasing the rate of L5 deficit because we're, we want to go too fast. I don't know. Okay. But, uh, and maybe because it's already 7.20, just a very quick question for all of you, very quick. First question would be, do you think we can avoid surgery in high-grade spondylolisthesis? And second question is, how often do you see the patient with asymptomatic low-grade? Sebastian. Uh, I think that uh, um, uh, Professor Mineo did, uh, did uh, answer the first question in his talk, like uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, when there is not that much symptoms in uh, high-grade spondylolisthesis, it's maybe not mandatory to propose them surgery. But in most of the most of the cases, they are symptomatic, so they they, they need surgery. So I'm not sure that you will that it's possible to uh, really avoid surgery in high-grade uh, uh, spondylolisthesis. And the second question was, please. Can How you often repeat? do you know your low grade? How often? How often do you see them? Symptomatic or not symptomatic? Let's say. How often do you see? Uh, it's difficult to answer, but the, the thing that I know is that uh, most of them are, are not symptomatic because it, they are not painful because of the low grade. They, so you they see them once, so do, do you see them once and say, come back if you're painful, or you say, I have to see you every six months, for example? Ah, sorry, yeah, I, I, I did not understand. Uh, the, um, maybe I, I'm too young because I, I'm quite... Uh, afraid of that and, and, and I'm seeing them uh, quite often like every six to 12 months but uh, uh, most of the time they, they didn't it did it, it doesn't change anything so maybe I should uh, see them uh, less frequently okay thank you and you Tom at least twice twice a year yeah at least twice in total just okay. to, 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 to see that there is in the beginning no progression Okay, and you, Ilka? Yeah, I would uh, say that if I have a growing child with high grade spondylolisthesis, I strongly recommend surgery because I've seen mm. the cases to progress to spondyloptosis and then it's very difficult to get them fused. Mm -hmm. um, and this, for the second question, I agree with Tom. So I typically take the low grade if they are more or less symptom free once to follow up with it after one year to see if there is progression and I advise the families that if they will get more symptoms you can come earlier but i think twice is enough okay and you carol i also see them twice to doing the growth phase i think you have to make an x-ray uh, after one year and after two years to make sure that uh, nothing moves and regarding the high grades, uh, I've never seen a high grade patient not qualifying for surgery. Either they are, either they are in pain uh, or they have a terrible sagittal profile or they have a neurologic problem. I've never seen somebody else. So I, I cannot imagine one qualifying for conservative uh, therapy. Thank you. And you, Professor Minero? Well, I, I didn't have time to show a video that we had that I saw a patient that came for uh, with neck pain and uh, for some sort of reason, we we did a long film, and my goodness, he had a spondyloptosis. He had three children, never had any back pain, did a normal life, 
and uh, with sports and everything. So we have to be a little bit cautious, obviously. The ones that are referred to our clinics are the ones that are symptomatic. But um, so for those with a high grade, usually what I do, it's very difficult because once they get referred to us, they've already seen a lot of other opinions and they all say, you need to be operated on, you need to be operated on. And it's so difficult sometimes to convince both the parents that they don't need surgery and we just need to follow them. So I very often fall into what Ilkas just mentioned that they end up doing. But as a matter of fact, when I recall and looking for the ones that I've done, I mean, most of them were symptomatic. So the ones that were not symptomatic probably Either because I don't operate, they went on and went operated on by somebody else. I'm not quite sure, but there's a lot of pressure from the parents once that has been diagnosed to do something. And how often do you see the low grade? Oh, the low grade, usually when the pain is over and they have resumed their sports and activities, I don't see well, just see if you need to come back. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we had uh, approximately 100 live participants, which is pretty good for the for this webinar. I think for a specific subject and uh, our subgroup, spinal subgroup. So this is very encouraging. I think for the next ones. And uh, thank you all of you for accepting the invitation for your, your great talks. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. So have a nice thank evening. You. Have a nice thank evening. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.